Thank you for joining us for today's message. We believe we can go anywhere in the world from right here in Lamarck, Texas and reach people just like you. If you'd like more information about Abundant Life, please visit ALCC.org. You can also text the number below if you would like to support the church financially. Be ready for a powerful message that's gonna impact your life. I was, uh, I was driving the other day in my car and my daughter, Mercedes, had gotten one of these from somewhere. I don't know where she even got it from. Had to got it from Children's Church, I guess. I don't know. Anyways, it was sitting in my car and I saw it, and I was like, man, I hadn't seen one of those in like 20 years. I said, I, it scares me that I'm old enough now to say that I haven't seen something in 20 years. But I looked at this, and I was like, man, I hadn't seen one of these in forever. And so I stuck my finger in it, and I was just like, oh, man, that's so cool. I can't believe, like, it, it fits. Like, it's my kids, but, it, you know, it fits my finger. That's awesome. And, and I'm sitting there at a red light with my finger stuck in the trap, And I look, and I was like, man, that's crazy. And I stuck my other finger in. True story. I stuck my other finger, and I swear to you, I'm three cars back, and the light turns green. And I was like, oh, Jesus, what am I going to do? I was like, oh, no. And so now I'm like, I'm yanking at it. I'm pulling it. I was like, I'm. So I drove from 2351 Clear Lake City Boulevard past Bay Area Boulevard, like almost into League City with, I mean, I was at like, I was at 11 and 1, like not even 10 and 2 because it didn't stretch that much. But I was like, God, how do I get this? I couldn't remember how to get this stupid thing off of my fingers. And so I know now how to, how to do it, but I didn't know then, and I got stuck. And so it did its job, like well played Chinese finger trap. The Chinese did it right in that. So tonight, 1 Samuel chapter 14, if you have your Bible. If you don't, they're going to throw it up on the screen, so you'll be all right. 1 Samuel tonight, chapter 14, and and the reason we have these tonight is because I don't know if anybody's ever felt stuck before. Anybody ever been stuck? You got stuck at a job that you couldn't stand? Got stuck in a marriage? Yikes. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Got quiet. That's for the Sunday morning crowd, not for y'all. I know y'all got it right. But you're stuck. You got stuck with some debt that you didn't think you deserved? You got stuck in a situation. Maybe, maybe you got struck, stuck at, at the strip club because your buddies left you, and now you got to find a way. I Look, I don't know your story. I don't know where you come from. But we've all been stuck somewhere. We've all had an opportunity where we got stuck in a place that we didn't want to be, that maybe we got ourselves into, maybe we didn't. But the reality was is we were stuck. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about how to get yourself unstuck. How to get away from being stuck. Look at your neighbor and say, you're stuck for the next 30 minutes listening to this. <laughs> Maybe 45 if we're lucky. We'll see. 1 Samuel 14, verse 1. One day Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, he said, come let us go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. And with him were about 600 men, among whom Ahijah was wearing the ephod of God. And he was the son of Ichabod's brother, Ahitub, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. It's a lot of names that are weird to pronounce, but I got through it. And no one was aware that Jonathan had left. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. And one was called Bozes, and the other was called Senna. One cliff stood on the north towards Michmash, and the other stood on the south towards Geba. Okay, now let's skip down to verse 14. And it said, in the first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. Then the panic struck the whole army and those in the camp and the field and those in the outposts and the raiding parties, and the ground shook, and it was a panic sent by God. So what I did was I gave you the beginning of this story, and I gave you the end of the story, but I'm going to talk about the middle of the story. I'm going to talk about what happened in the middle, because I think that this is going to make some sense to you. Uh, First of all, I I just want to kind of explain to everybody, I'm going to give you God's plan for your life. Look, Drake sang sang about it, but I'm going to give you what God wants you to have. You know what God's plan is for your life? God wants you to win. I need a better amen than that if, if... I felt like I was back in my Presbyterian church when I was a kid. God wants you to win. The problem with saying amen to that is to, for some of you, that statement 
contradicts your experience. Because I'm telling you God wants you to win, but all you're feeling in life is loss. All you're feeling in life is struggle. But I'm telling you, God wants you to win. God's got a plan for you. But you're saying to me, sin where you're sitting, you're saying, man, that's nice to hear. God wants me to win. You know, that's, that's the most, like, pat Christian statement there is. God wants you to win. And you're like, man, that would be awesome. Tell the debt collector. Tell my doctor. Tell my kids that won't talk to me. Tell my wife who hates me. God wants me to win. Where is he? I don't know if anybody has ever experienced that before. I mean, I know y'all got your, your angel's wings tucked in deep tonight, kind of just patronizing me, but I'll be real with you. I've had experiences like that where somebody said, God wants you to win. I'll be like, man, it would be awesome if he would show up and do that because my experience contradicted the statement. You see, so many of us, what we want to do is we want to bring our theology, big church word, we want to bring our theology down to the level of our reality. But God doesn't call you to bring his theology down to your reality. He requires you and he calls you to elevate your reality to the level of his theology. That's a heck of a place to amen right there if you were going to do it. Why? Because you're saying, I'm going to go ahead and not look at what I see, not look at what looks like it's going to be the end of me, but I'm going to take the reality that I have in life and I'm going to lift it up and believe that I can see from a different perspective. Because if you can see from a different perspective in your life, if you can get away from the woe is me, I can't handle this anymore, if you can step outside of that for just a second, Man, I'm telling you, it changes the way you react. It changes how your life is. And so some of us are in a cycle of being stuck. We are in a cycle of being stuck. And the harder we pull and the more we struggle, the tighter the trap gets. I don't know if anybody's put their finger trap on yet. You can if you want to try it. I'm going to explain how it works real quick so you're not just sitting there all day like pulling at it. So watch. Put your fingers in. Let's all do this together. It'll be fun. Come on. Oh, there you go. See if you can get your pinky around. Um, But watch. You got this. Okay? Everybody got it? Look, the harder you pull, let's just do this for an experience because I want you to feel what it's like. The harder you pull, what happens? The tighter it gets. So you're stuck and you're pulling, trying to get out. But the harder you pull, the tighter it traps you. And then you start getting nervous. And then you start worrying, am I ever going to get free of this or am I stuck for the rest of my days? I'm trying to give you something physical to relate to what's happening in the spiritual. So you're pulling hard and you're getting more and more trapped. You want to know how to get out of it? Push. You push and you get out, but you pull, and you stay trapped. So I was sitting there in the car pulling, and instead of pulling, I should have been pushing. Well, some of us in our life, some of us in the spiritual world, we've been pulling against God. We've been standing still and pulling, and God said, if you just push in instead of pulling back, maybe you'd get the answer you've been believing for. Maybe what's got you stuck would not hold you so tight. Somebody told me the other day, they said, you know what? They said, it's not about winning. It's about having fun. I hate that. I don't say amen to that. I hate that. It's not about winning. It's just about having fun. They say, you got kids now. I got little kids. I got a three-year-old, twin, 18-month-old boys. They say, man, you got to teach your kids. Life is not about winning. It's just, they just got to have fun. No, they don't. You know why? Because I'm not having fun unless I'm winning. If I'm losing, I'm not having fun. I'm miserable if I'm losing. Why? Because I don't, I don't buy into that. I don't buy into that. Now watch, I know, you know if you're at the t-ball game and your kid's team is losing, then yeah, say that. We're, it's, we're just having fun. But watch, if your kid's winning, you're excited that they're winning. You're like, yeah, that's right, my kid's awesome. The other kids, I'm not going to say what they are from up here. But, but watch, you can say, man, that's great. I love winning. Because you know what? I love winning. I do. I'm a great winner. I'm a terrible loser. I'm the sorest loser there ever was. It's not, that I, it's not that I hate losing, it's just I despise it. 
Like I despise, I hate it more than hate. I don't like to lose. Watch, you, you're talking, we're talking spiritual. And I'm not talking about beating you in baseball. I'm talking spiritually here. Because we say sometimes winning is not an option. There's no other option but to win, right? Have you ever, have you ever thought about that? If you've got cancer, winning is the only option. If you're facing a divorce, winning is the only option. If you're struggling with debt, winning is the only option. Look, if, if, if I'm standing against somebody and they got cancer in their body and they're about to die, and I tell them, well, look, at least you had fun. No, they don't want to hear that. What they want to hear is you can beat this cancer and you can live and not die. Why? Because winning has to be the only option. When we're talking about spiritual things, if God didn't want you to win, then why did he give up his son? Why did he send his son to this world if for not to have you win? No, God wants you to win. But thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph, who always leads us in a triumphant procession. Thanks be to God who always causes us to win. Can somebody get behind that scripture in 2 Corinthians? I can get behind that. I can get excited about that. You know what I feel like in life? Sometimes I feel like a weeble. Not a weevil. I feel like a weeble. I wobble, but I don't fall down. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Hit your neighbor and say, you look like a weeble. I see you over there wobbling. I see you wobbling, but you don't fall down. You can wobble all day. I can hit you, and you might go all the way down, but you're going to pop right back up. I used to have a Rocky Balboa little punching bag. I'd punch it, it'd come back, and it'd come right back to me. And no matter how much I hit it, it always popped right back up. Look, that's what God is calling you to be. God is saying, you got to be a weeble. you got to wobble. But you don't fall down. You say, devil, you can knock me back, but you can't knock me down. Somebody shout if you're excited about that. But you see, sometimes in life there's a discrepancy on watch. When he wants you to win, when God wants you to win, and when you want to win. Because what if God says your time to win is not now? What if God says this is not the battle you're going to win because there's a bigger war that's coming, and I want you to win the war, but you might have to lose a battle. We don't like to hear that because that's not fun to hear because you're like, I thought I was supposed to win every single time. I did too. But what if God has a bigger, better victory tomorrow, and so the no you're hearing today is not a no, but it's a wait? What if it's a not yet? And so what if you've been believing for a yes, but God says not yet? What if God is saying, I've got something better for you tomorrow? Sometimes God is working on winning battles in us, before he wins battles for us. That's a good word for somebody. Because that means that maybe you're in preparation time. Maybe you're being prepared for something bigger than what you're facing today. And so God is working on winning some battles on the inside of you. God is building your character before he puts you in the place that he knows your character is going to need to hold you. Man, that's a tough word to hear, but it's the one that you needed. You see, Jonathan, in this story that we're talking about, he needed a breakthrough because the children of Israel, they were trapped, and they had the Philistines coming against them. And so Jonathan was the king's son, and he's in a bad place, and he's, he's trapped in this place, and he needed a breakthrough. You see, us Christians, we talk about breakthroughs a lot, but I think sometimes breakthrough, the word breakthrough is an overrated word because we think when we get a breakthrough, that means the battle's over. What if your breakthrough just positions you to fight the battle that you're in? What if the breakthrough that you've got now is the one that just gets you in the right spot so that you can fight the battle that God has put you in? Breakthroughs do not always eliminate the battle. They just put you in a position to fight. Now watch this. Back it up a chapter in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel, verse 19. Now, this is what's crazy because the Israelites now in chapter 14 are standing there, and they're, they're waiting to fight, but watch not a blacksmith, verse 19 of 1 Samuel 13, not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel because the Philistines had said otherwise the Hebrews would make swords or spears. So all of Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plow points, their mattocks, their axes, their sickles sharpened. The price was two-thirds of a shekel for sharpening plow points and mattocks and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes and for repointing goads. And so on the day of the battle... All right, watch this. The Israelites are going into a battle. On the day of the battle, <laughs> not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or a spear in his hand. 
So they're going up to war, and they've got no weapons. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. Now, a detachment of the Philistines had gone out to the pass at Michmash. So Jonathan was at the pass. The Israelites were at an impasse. And how many of y'all know sometimes the devil tries to head you off at the pass? That's where the devil's trying to get you. He tries to cut you off at the pass. And watch this. The temptation at the pass is to be passive. So often at the past, when, when God is trying to get us somewhere good, God is, is delivering us into something great. We want to be passive, and we want to sit back and wait on God. But what if God was saying it's time to go? Watch this. Before the enemy can defeat you, he must first disarm you. Because the enemy knows that your weapons are better than his, that your weapons are greater than his, and you have weapons that God has given you. But watch, if your weapons are misplaced, they're worthless. If you don't have your weapon in your hand, what good is it? If you don't have it with you, what good is it? I used to, when I was in school, I, I, you know, everybody bought school supplies. Everybody just got done buying school supplies. And I can remember going to school, and I'd have all the school supplies, you know, going in. And by day three, every one of them was lost or misplaced. And I would go into class, and I'd be like, man, I need a pencil. I don't have a pencil. Nobody would let me borrow one. And the teacher that I had was a real jerk, and he had taken any time he found a pencil, he would sharpen it down to that big. So it was like that much eraser and that much pencil. And then what he would do is all day he would chew on it. And so if you needed a pencil and you were without, he said, I've got one you can borrow. And if you had no other option, you were forced to use his gross, tiny little chewed up gross pencil. There were more times than I can count that that was the pencil that I used because I had misplaced what I was supposed to have. Watch this. A weapon that is misplaced, a weapon that is lost is useless. It's no good for you. They were desperate, but they were disarmed. You want to have victory? You want to get unstuck? I got three things for you. Number one, you got to remember this, that you can win with what you've got. If you're a no-taker, write that down. You can win with what you've got. You got to remember that the Israelites, in, in chapter 13, we read about it, that the Israelites had given over all of the power to make tools, to make any kind of metalwork. They had given their enemy, the Philistines, the power to be the blacksmiths. And so if they needed a, 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 a plow sharpened, they had to take it to the enemy to sharpen their plow because the enemy had robbed them of the ability to use what they had. They gave over the ability to form what they had for weapons to the hand of the enemy. You cannot give over the abilities that God has given you to the enemy. If you do, you'll never win. Watch this. The devil has no problem with you being in the knowledge, knowing how to farm. He just doesn't want you to know how to fight. He says, you can wield a hoe, you can wield a pitchfork, you can wield a plow, but I don't want you to know how to use a sword. He has no problem with you knowing how to farm, but he just doesn't want you to fight. You see, they had iron, they had the resource, but they lacked the ability to do anything with what God gave them. Man, that's one of the greatest tools of the enemy. You can have all the skill, all the character, all the power in the world, but if you don't know how to use it, if you don't know how to harness it, if you don't know how to, to work it, you can have all the ability, but you got to work with what God gave you. But God says, listen, I will teach you. I'm the blacksmith. God is the one that will divinely show you how to do with what he has given you. But you got to go to the one and watch when the iron meets the hammer, something erupts out of the fire of your life. The world brings the fire and God drops the hammer. I don't know if anybody here has ever been under some fire, under some heat, but when life brings the heat, God always drops a hammer. It's about preparation. It's about preparation for your purpose. Man, this is one of the greatest verses in the world, Isaiah 54 and 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. No 
weapon formed against you. That's what we're talking about here. That's what they're talking about. They're like, man, we got weapons that are being formed against us, but we've got none against, none that are for us. But watch, no weapon formed against you will prosper. As a preacher, that's a great verse for me to talk about because you're standing there and you got stuff, you got struggles, you've got issues coming against you. And I can stand up here and say, I don't care what's happening in your life. No weapon formed against you. If the devil can form it, he can't conquer you. He can't control you. He can't own you with the weapons that he's formed against you. Why? Because God is bigger on the inside. But watch, just as great as that verse, I think this one's even better in, verse, or in chapter 49 and verse 2. It says, he made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. You say, what does that mean? That means not only does no weapon formed against you prosper, but watch, now God is forming you into his secret weapon. God says, not only are you protected from the weapons of the enemy, but God said, now I'm creating you to be a weapon that can be used against the enemy. God is working things in your life. Hit your neighbor and say, I'm a weapon. Hit your second choice neighbor and say, I'm a weapon too. I'm a weapon. So number one, what was number one? Number one is you can win with what you've got. Number two, you can win. Number two, you can win with who you have. Anybody got some haters in their life? Anybody got people that don't like them? They just hate on them? They've been drinking that haterade. That's what they say. Anybody got people like that? Anybody got people that don't like you? You don't even know why, but they just don't? I got all kinds of people don't like me. Go figure, right? I tell this all the time. I tell my mom that. I'm like, Mom, man, these people, they just don't like me. There's some people that just, they don't like me. And she's like, you? I was like, I know. Can you believe it? She's like, but you're the most likable boy that there ever was. I'm like, I know, Mom. It's crazy. But, but I mean, there's crazy people in the world that just don't like me. She's like, well, shame on them. I'm like, you're dang right, shame on them. Uh, but there's just people, man. Everybody's got haters. Watch, if you don't got any haters, then you're not doing nothing right. That means you're not standing for nothing. You're not doing nothing. If you don't got nobody that's telling you you're crazy, you must not be doing anything awesome. Because it's only the people that are doing something that got haters. I mean, that's the truth. But watch this. We're not just talking about people that are stupid, if I can say it like that. We're not just talking about people that hate you. But watch, what if I'm talking about people that left you? What if I'm talking about people that were your friends but they're not anymore? That they were, your, they were the people that you thought, man, God brought these people into my life to help me, to, to make me into something great. But now they're gone and they've left me. But watch, maybe they left you because their chapter in your life is over. Man, that's a good word for somebody because God's writing the book of your life. And maybe the chapter that they were in is over. So God closed the chapter and they went their way. It doesn't make them bad people. But watch, God won't let anyone who left you limit you. That is a good word for somebody that you feel like you've been limited. You feel like you've been dragged back and, and robbed from. But God won't let anybody who left you limit you. If you can't live without them, they won't leave you. I'm going to say that again because I never heard it so quiet in my life. If you can't live without them, they won't leave you. If you can live without them, then it's okay if they go. And you've probably said, man, I just can't live. If they leave me, I can't live without them. And maybe that's the truth, but guess what? If you can't live without them, they'll never leave you. But if you can, then just know that they might. They might go. And it doesn't make nobody a bad person. It doesn't make them bad. It doesn't make them wrong. It just means their season in your life was over. And it doesn't mean they're bad. Because I got people in my life who left, and I got people who talked bad about me and said bad stuff about my family and bad stuff about people that I love. And you know what? That's all right. It doesn't make them bad people. It just means they were hurt people. And hurt people hurt people. And so I just realized in my life that not everybody's going to be with me forever. I wish they were. But there are some people that just got to go. And so I just bless them. I say, man, I'm, I'm happy that we had the time we had. And I hope you do well with your life. And I always, watch, I always leave people like this. I leave them with arms wide open saying, look, if you ever want to come back, you got, you got plenty of options. Let's come back. But if you don't, man, I love you. I hope you do well in your life. 
One conversation in your world can change your entire life. One conversation can change your world. Jonathan had one conversation. He had one talk with one person, and it changed his life forever. You just need one conversation. Why? Because if God is for you, who can be against you? Who can be against you? If you're doing what God has called you to do, it doesn't matter what anybody says. It doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter what they do. If God is for you, who can be against you? Not everyone was meant for the journey that you're on. So Jonathan, the Bible says, won this battle. We, we spoiled the end of the story. Jonathan won the battle. And they killed like 20 guys. And watch this. It says immediately after they won that battle, that people started coming out of the woodwork. That all the people that had left them, all the people that had deserted them, all the people they thought were gone forever, all of a sudden those people started showing back up. Why? Because have you ever noticed when something good starts happening in your life, all the people that left you and talked bad about you, now they start showing up. You win the lottery one time, I promise you're going to have friends from, from way back that you didn't even know you had. All of a sudden, they're going to be knocking at your door and be like, hey, you remember me? I'm your cousin. You're like, yeah, you're my cousin. You used to sleep on my couch and eat my cereal. Like, how dare you? But they're like, I heard you won the lottery. What's up? And um, I mean, if you win the lottery, call me. I'll come say that if nobody else does. But watch. Not everybody in your life was meant for the journey that you're on. But the people that God has put in your life on purpose, if they're supposed to be here, they won't leave. They're supposed to be here. If you didn't get encouragement from where you wanted, you'll get strength from God from where you needed it. In the area that you needed it, you'll get strength even if you didn't get the encouragement that you were expecting. Because so many of us, man, I, I don't know about you, but I thrive on encouragement. I love being encouraged. I encourage myself. My wife encourages me. Man, I know I've preached bad messages before, and I'll get in the car, and she'll encourage me. And if she doesn't, I'll call my folks up because they watch every week. I'll be like, hey, y'all, did you watch that? They'll be like, oh, my God, that's the best message you ever preached. I'm like, that's right. Thank you. That's all I needed to hear. You did your job. I'll talk to you later. Click. It's over. They just, like, I'm going to have them record that, and I'll just listen to the voicemail, and it's over. That's the way it needs to be. Watch. We all like encouragement. But if you don't get encouragement from where you want it, God will give you the strength where you need it. Because that's the God that we serve. Number three, point number three, as we get ready to wind this down. You can win from where you are. You can win with what you got. You can win with who you're with. And you can win from where you are. Man, it's easy to talk about the victories. It's easy to talk about the wins. But you know what? This, this whole chapter you got the beginning of it that talks, that gives the context, that tells you they're in a battle. You got the end of it that tells you Jonathan won. But the middle of the chapter is talking about the journey from where he was to where he needed to be. It's talking about the cliffs. Not like the cliffs, like the dude named Cliff that's like there's two of them and they're the cliffs that are in this battle. But I'm talking about the two cliffs on the side of the valley. Because that's what it's talking about, and we're going to talk about it in a second. Because on each side of the valley was a cliff. One was called Bozaz, which, and one was called Sina, okay? So you got Bozaz on one side, and you've got Sena, Sena on the other. Now, it's interesting because they mean different things, obviously, because they're different names. But watch, when you look at what their names mean, and a lot of times, uh, you know, as preachers, we'll do that because there's more description Preaching in the original amen. language that you would understand if you spoke Hebrew. I don't, but thank God Google does. So I Googled what those words meant because I wanted to know. Watch this. Bozes literally means gleaning or slippery. So you got this slippery slope on the one side. And watch this. Senna on the other side, it means thorny. So you got thorns on one side, and you got slick rock on the other side. On one side of your victory is thorny. So you got the pain of the progress getting through the thorns. Can you imagine Jonathan and his armor bearer, every step they took? Watch, it says that they were climbing up this, this side of this hill, and they were on all fours. They were climbing like dogs, trying to get to the top of the hill on National Dog Day. We're talking about it. But they were climbing, and can you imagine every step, every claw, they were getting scratched up, and thorns stuck to him, and they were climbing. Every time his hand hit, it hurt. And watch this. On the other side was the slippery slope. I don't know. I think we can all relate to one or the other. These are probably both. 
that you've been struggling in life, going through what feels like thorns, and every step you take, you feel like you're getting stabbed. But on the other side, when you say, man, it can't get worse than this, but on the other side is a slippery slope, and that's the fear of failure. The fear of if I get too high and I fall back, I'm going to lose. I've got slippery slopes on one side. And watch, every time I get to a new height, that just means I've got farther to fall. Because we all deal with stuff like that. We all think about it like that. If you don't, then I need to be listening to you talk. Because obviously you got it figured out because I'm dealing with stuff like this constantly where, where I'm slipping on one side and I'm being stabbed on the other. And Jonathan and his armor bearer are climbing up hands and feet. They're exposed, they're vulnerable, but they're committed. You want to be successful in life, you want to be able to get unstuck when you're stuck and trapped, then there are some areas that you've got to expose in your life. There are some areas you've got to be vulnerable in your life, you've got to be committed because you can win without supplies. You can win without supports. You can, you can win where you are in a bad situation. You can win with no diploma, no bank account. You can win in a bad situation, but there's one thing in life that you can't win without. And some of us are sitting there thinking, man, Jesus, I can't win without Jesus. All right, that makes sense, but I'm going to go deeper than that. Because Jesus is the easy answer. Jesus makes sense. But watch, there's something even deeper than this. It says that Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah, and he was under the pomegranate tree in Migron. Watch, so, so the Israelites are stuck, right? They're stuck. No matter how hard they try and get out, they can't because they don't have weapons, and they don't have any hope, and the army of the Philistines is coming against them, and they're stuck. And Saul, the king... It says it's under the pomegranate tree, and the pomegranate tree every time represents the place of comfort, the place of just staying put. It's got shade. It's got fruit. Everything is good. And it says that he's got the, the, the vestment, the ephod, that represents God. And the thing about it is, is he's stuck, watch this, waiting on the will of God, saying, God, if it's your will, Man, how many times have lazy people said that statement so they could stay doing nothing? Oh, boy, that, that hurts a little bit, right? Like, that's not easy to hear because there's so many times, so many people that because they're just content and comfortable will stay put saying, God, if it's your will. So they stay on the couch in their pajamas eating spaghetti watching Judge Judy. While everybody else is out doing something, they just stay put, and they will stay stuck forever. Watch this, because doing nothing is the same as going backwards. Doing nothing is the same as going backwards. It's the same as if, if, I'm, if I just did nothing with this Chinese finger trap for the rest of my life, my fingers will stay here forever. It's not like this thing's magically going to disappear. It's going to stay like this forever. Doing nothing is the same thing, watch, as pulling by myself, trying to get out of it by myself, saying, I'm going to just pull until this gets fixed. The pomegranate is luxury. It's business as usual. It's waiting on God to give an opportunity. But watch, Jonathan finally got fed up, and he said, man, I'm not going to sit here like everybody else and just waste my time. He said, I'm going to do something. Watch this. He activated the will of God. He looked at his buddy and he just said, I don't need everybody. I don't need a whole crew to go with me. I need one person who's going to volunteer. His armor bearer, the dude that's with him all the time, was like, man, let's go. He said, let's go and face this thing that we fear. Watch this. He tells his armor bearer. He said, this is how we'll know. He said, watch, I'm not going to wait for God to tell me. I'm going to make it happen. So what did he do? He said, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force their hand. Because I know it's your will for us to win. Why? Because God already told them, I'm going to cause you to overcome in this battle. He didn't need a new word. He activated the word that was spoken originally. So what did he do? He said, man, let's go. And he said, if they say anything to us, if they say anything 
then we're going to know that it's God's will for us to go. So they started hiking. They started going. And watch, it said that as they go, that somebody looks down at them and they're like, boy, come and get it. They're like, hey, we see y'all, and only one of you got a sword, so come and get it. And they're climbing up. They got scratches, thorns all over in them. They're worried about slipping on the other side, but it said they get to the top, and when they do, they start killing people. Jonathan kills the first one, grabs his sword, tosses it to his armor bearer, then they just start wiping people out. Over 20 men, it said, were killed like that. And, I mean, that's kind of serious now because we're like, whoa, they killed him. But that's the way it was. But watch this. You've got to have will, not just the will of God. You've got to have will power. You want to be victorious? You want to get unstuck in your life? You say, man, I'm stuck in a marriage. I'm stuck in my finances. I'm stuck in whatever. you got to have willpower. Instead of pulling against God, instead of pulling against your situation, instead of pulling against whatever's going on, you've got to what? Dive in a little bit deeper. You've got to press in a little bit because just like this finger trip, the more you press, the looser it gets. If you want to get free, you've got to press a little bit. And if you press, all of a sudden, you get released. And watch, he's been waiting, Saul's been waiting on God to say, God, show me your will. Show me your will. But Jonathan said, I'm not going to let God show me his will. I will. Look at your neighbor and say, I will. Jonathan said, I will cross over this. I will get over that, that old memory. I will fix my marriage. I will get my money right. I will get my life right. I will. Watch, I can't do it by myself, but I know God on the inside of me. I know that I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises will continually be on my lips. You got to just start shouting to God every once in a while. When you just get in a place where you feel stuck, you got to say, God, this is the day that you have made, and I will. I'm not going to wait on your will. I will. Because watch, your will gets God's will activated in your life. You want God to work in your life? Your will activates it. You can't just sit back and wait on him. It's on you. And Jonathan activated it. God said, watch, you bring the will and I'll bring the power. You don't even got to have it all. You just have to have the will, and God will bring the power. And his power will cause you to win. And so what does the devil do? The devil tries to discourage you. How does he do that? He tries to discourage you because he doesn't want you to see or feel like you're getting any progress. That happens with me all the time because I'm constantly on a diet. I'm just, I'm, I'm terrible because I'll, I'll drop a bunch of weight, then I'll gain it all back because I eat, I eat terrible. I'm just, it's, it's just the way I am. It's, it's horrible. And so I told Catherine, I said, tomorrow I'm starting to juice again. I'm going to go back on a juice diet only, lose like 20 pounds, and then let's, let's make some cookies and do it right. You know, like that's, it's just, this is the vicious cycle that I live, honestly, right? I mean, it is. So I'll, do nothing but liquids for five days, like lose 10 pounds, and then gain 12 on the weekend because I'm just, I have no willpower in that. So, but watch, anytime I go on a diet, which is constant, I mean, I'm, I'm up here every week and I talk to you every week about how I'm on a diet this week. But watch, every time I'm on a diet, I don't know if I'm the only one, but like it takes like three weeks for me to get results. I feel like I'm extra fat for two full weeks. And I get so discouraged. I'm like, man, this stupid diet's not working. Like, keto my foot. Like, this ain't working. Like, all this keto nonsense. Like, you know, eat cheese and you're going to lose weight. I'm like, I eat cheese and I gain 20 pounds. This is stupid. But watch, the devil does that in your life. He doesn't want you to see any progress. Because if he can keep you from seeing progress, he can keep you discouraged. But watch, the only thing that you can't win without is your will. It's the only thing in your life that you can't win without is your will. But watch, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. When it looks like it can't be done, when it looks like it's not possible, when it looks like everything is coming against you, that's when God makes a way. But watch, God makes a way, but your faith has to make the climb. Because there was a way in this story. God made a way, but Jonathan still had to climb. 
And they had to go through the thorns, and he had to watch out for the slope on the other side that was slippery. But watch, no matter what happens, God makes a way, but you got to make the climb. you got to do your part because it's not going to be ice cream and, and rainbows for the rest of your life. God doesn't make a way and then make an elevator. I wish he did, but that's not how he works. Life isn't an escalator with God where you just stand on and, like, lean against the railing while it pulls you up. That's not how God works. Man, God works like the escalator that's broken, that those steps are extra steep, and you got to, like, climb them to get to the second level of Dillard's. You're like, man, there ain't even nothing up in the second level of Dillard's that I want. I just wanted to see what they got, and now i got to climb the extra steep escalator? Like, that's how life is. Sometimes God makes a way, but your faith has to make the climb. It may be thorny, and it may be slippery. It may be costly. It may be painful, but watch, it's worth it. It's worth it every time because God says, I'm going to find you a way. Why? Because God wants you to win. But you say, what's my job in this, God? If you want me to win, what's my job? Your job is to keep climbing. Because if you stop climbing, then how can you ever win? How can you ever get into the battle if you never make it to the battle? Maybe 2018, maybe this year feels like it's climbing on top of you. Maybe it feels like it's drowning you, and it's, it's the struggle still from Hurricane Harvey a year ago still is just like, it's just the weight of it is on top of you, and this world is climbing on top of you. But I'm telling you, let's flip the script, and let's go ahead and get above what's going on. Let's get above all the weight of this world, and let's lift our eyes to see something other than the struggle. You bring the will, and God will bring the power. The miracle in Michmash, the miracle that happened here, it was not initiated by God in this story. It was initiated by Jonathan. And watch, Jonathan didn't need a word from God to get going. God didn't speak to start the miracle. What he did is he spoke before. God had already spoken, and God said, you will overcome the Philistines. So Jonathan, was this miracle was based on what God had previously spoken. So watch, God is going to use a previously spoken promise in your life to break you through. And maybe God's going to say something tonight, or maybe God already said something. Maybe that you got something a year ago, or five years ago, or ten years ago, that God was going to change your world, and God was going to do something great. And God was going to wreck everything, and you were going to finally have the peace, finally have the money you've been believing for, finally have the health in your body. I don't know what your story is, but I'm telling you tonight, you don't have to get a word from God tonight. Because I've been sitting there, and I've been saying, man, if God would just give me a word tonight, my whole life would change. You don't need a word from God tonight. You need to act on what God said last night. You need to act on God what God said last week or last month or last year or 10 years ago. you got to act on what God already said. And so many of us, watch, we stay stuck, pulling, trying to do it all ourselves, saying, God, I don't need you. I can do it all by myself. Or what? We stay stuck doing nothing. And doing nothing is the same as going backwards. But Jonathan pressed and he said, God, you already spoken, so I'm going to press. I'm going to give him my best. I'm going to do everything I can do, God, so that you can do everything that you can do. And watch, God's power is available for every one of us. You've got the power of God in your hand, resting there, waiting to go to work, but God is waiting on you. You're not waiting on God. And look, I don't know where you're at tonight spiritually. Everybody's in a different place. We all do different things. We've all been different places. We've all, you know, lived different lives, every one of us. Some of our lives have been good, some haven't. But the great news is, is you're all in the same place at one time. And God said it doesn't matter where you were yesterday. It doesn't matter what you did five years ago. What matters is where you are here and what you're doing now. Look, I like to tell people all the time, man, God is less interested about what you've done and where you've been and much more interested about who you are today and where you're going to be tomorrow. That's what God is interested in. But we don't hear that so often because it's easy to keep people bound up. But I'm not trying to get you stuck in a finger trap for the rest of your life. I'm trying to get you free forever. And so right now, I'm going to ask every person, if you would, to just bow your head real quick and close your eyes. 
And I'm going to just ask before we leave this evening, and we're going to be out of here in five minutes, but I'm going to ask if you say, man, Josh, you say, you know what? God, I feel like I'm in that place. You say, I just, I feel like my life is just going crazy. I didn't, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. You say, man, I, you know, if I died today, I don't even know where I would go. I don't know where I'd spend eternity. I don't know even know if eternity is real. And you say, man, I just need to know. I want to go to heaven. I'm interested in going to heaven. I want that life. I want a new life. I don't want to be the same that I was yesterday. I want to be a different person. And maybe that's you tonight. And there's nobody looking around this evening. we got our heads bowed and our eyes closed. But I'm going to ask if that is you on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to just slip your hand up in the air and say, man, that's me tonight. I want to change my life. I want my whole world to change. And you say, I want to be a better person tomorrow than I was today. If that's you on three, I'm going to ask you real quick to just slip your hand up. Nobody's looking around tonight. It's just me and you. Here it comes. One, two, three. Three, you say, man, that's me. I want to change my life. Thank you. Who else? I see you there. I see you there. Thank you. Who else? Anybody else? You say, man, that's me. I see you back there. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? And then there's hands up all over. You can lower those hands. And I'm going to ask every person to look up this direction. Man, the Bible is it's so simple. It's so clear. Watch, we've probably been taught, you probably heard your whole life that, that God is like some angry old man with a big white beard, and, and it's like he's standing up there in heaven with a baseball bat trying to beat the sinners away. It's probably what you've been taught. That's probably what you think somewhere deep inside that, man, God is mad at me because I've made mistakes. I've told this story a dozen times, but I think it's so great. I used to fly to Dallas every week. We had a church in Dallas. We would fly there every single week, and I was on the plane one time with a guy, and, and I would fool people because, like, ideally you get on the plane and the person you're sitting next to has headphones on so you don't have to talk to them. And I would be that person. I always got on the plane first, and I sat there, and I put my headphones on, and I'd sit and wait. And I flew southwest, so they just pack people in. And the second they closed that door where nobody can get up, I popped my headphones off and looked over at the person next to me. And I just sat there and looked at them until they acknowledged me. And then we began our conversation. And I started to talk to them, and, and we talk about whatever. And I sat there next to a guy. He was probably in his late 40s, and we were talking. And he was a businessman, this and that. He was traveling for business. And, and he didn't ask what I did, and I didn't offer it up at first. And about three-quarters away, 30, 40 minutes into the flight, he looked over, and, and he said, well, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm a preacher. And he looked at me. He's like, you don't look like any preacher i ever seen. You know, my, my pants had bigger holes in them. I was wearing Nikes, you know. And, and he looked at me. He said, man, you don't look like a preacher. I said, well, I said, that's what I do. And and he said, man, I said, well, you know, what about you? Do you go to church? Is that, is that your thing? He said, no. He said, man, not me. He said, I used to. But he said, man, I just, I've done too, this is what he said. He said, I've done too many bad things for God to have anything to do with me. And, man, that statement broke my heart real quick because I was, and I'm not a crier. I mean, sometimes if it's like a sad movie, I'll cry. But, like, or, you know, like a picture of a puppy, like, I'll cry at that. But, like, I'm not a crier, you know, like. But, man, I, I, I kind of I started well because I'm like, man, this dude is in a place where he feels like he has no hope. And I looked at him and I said, man, I said, you know what? I said, I believe one right decision can erase a lifetime of bad decisions. He said, I've made 40 years of bad decisions. I said, well, the good news is, is one right decision today can erase 40 years of bad. And he says, what do I have to do? And I took his hand on a Southwest airplane as we were landing in Dallas. And the two of us, with tears streaming down our faces, people looking at us like we're crazy, said a prayer together. And that man's life changed. And I believe he's going to heaven today. Why? Because there's a loving God who loved him enough to change his whole world. And watch, that same God is here tonight. And he wants to change your life. And you say, what do I have to do? The Bible is so simple. God's not standing there with a baseball bat. He's standing there with arms wide open. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that God sent his son to the world, that Jesus came to this earth, if you believe that, and then if you believe that he died on a cross, and he rose from the grave, if you believe it, and the Bible says if you say it out loud with your mouth, you'll go to heaven. You say, man, that's too easy. I know. It's too easy. But that's how God made it. Why? Because he wanted everybody to have a chance. And so I'm going to ask every person in the room, place one hand on your heart and lift that other hand to heaven. Every single person, if you've said this prayer a thousand times or today's your first, I want everybody to say this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, today I give my life to Jesus Christ. Jesus, 
I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you came to this world. You died on a cross. You were buried. And on the third day, you rose from the grave. I believe you did this just for me. So today, take my life. Change me. Heal me. Set me free. From this moment on, I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. My life will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now put your hands together tonight. Look, if you said that prayer tonight, if you say, I've never said it before, you said it a thousand times. The Bible says you are going to heaven. Your whole life from this moment on can change. The Bible says your sins, all the bad stuff, all the mistakes, all your failures, those have all been washed away, and God's given you a brand new start tonight. Man, I'm excited for you. I believe that God's doing something good in you tonight. But it starts with you making that decision. God says you bring the will, and I'll give you the power. And so that's how we win. You can win with what you've got. You can win with who you're with. And you can win with where you are. You don't have to go somewhere great for God to use you. God can use you right here and right now. And I believe it's going to happen in Jesus' name. Amen. To learn more, visit WalterHallam.net. Here you'll find a list of resources to help you with your daily walk in Christ.